Galatians, as we have said, uh, is what I call the letter of grace. But we talked about how Paul breaks it into three segment, segments. Uh, there is the doctrinal, the practical, and then the argument where he defends himself. One and two is the defense, the argument. Uh, chapters uh, three and four are the doctrinal and five to six are the practical application. But we're in chapter two. He's still in this uh, argument of defending his faith, defending his ministry, and defending his message. Uh, but this section, chapter 2, starting in verse 1, all the way through verse number 10, it coincides with Acts chapter 15, uh, when Paul and Barnabas and Titus went up to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem ca uh, Council, that first Jerusalem Council. And we're going to look at that over there in Acts chapter 15 in just a minute. This, Acts chapter 2, was Paul's first spiritual warfare, first um, fight for the freedom that we have in Christ. Now, we don't think much of that today because we understand the freedom we have in Christ. But Paul's day, there was no such thing as grace alone by faith alone. Because all of the Jewish believers still held to the Jewish law. They still, uh, matter of fact, in uh, first, uh, Acts chapter 15, verse number 1, here's what the opening argument was for this council by the Judaizers. Uh, in Acts 15, chapter 1 says, Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised in the tradition of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so we so here's these Judaizers and these Jewish believers that are trying to enslave what Christ has set free. Now, why is this such a big issue for Paul to the church at Galatia? And why is it so important today? As I was writing and thinking about this message, this lesson, and this whole book. I kind of understood what Paul was thinking because Paul had went to Galatia and established a church on Christ and him crucified. And after he did, these believers began to believe or buy into what these Judaizers were saying and leading them back into bondage. As, as a pastor and as a Christian, I've seen many Christians get ensnared by one doctrine or another over the years that have hindered their freedom in Christ. There are some people that believe if you're not baptized, you're not saved. There are some people that believe if you don't believe this, you're not saved. Or if you don't do this, you're not saved. And it's no different than what these Judaizers were telling these Gentiles in the first century church. And it was a matter of emphasis in Paul's ministry. Paul took it very personal and very serious because it wasn't about Paul's ministry. It was about the gospel of grace. And if we ever forget that, we too, much like the Galatians or even the Judaizers, begin to add to the freedom and the grace that God has bestowed upon us. By adding to or taking away from that grace. So this first fight was about freedom in Christ. And he was willing to fight for that freedom. Had Paul here in Galatians 2 and Acts 15 not had this council meeting. Christianity may have never been more than a Jewish sect preaching law and grace mixed together. But because of Paul's courage and determination, the gospel of grace was accepted by the Jew Jerusalem church, by Peter, James, and John, and the other apostles there with grace and blessing and accepted. Not because they were... This is what I love about this passage and in Acts 15. They didn't accept the message simply by somebody's word. They saw the results and looked at what God had done. 
and looked at it in light of Scripture and made a decision. They didn't take the Judaizers word. They didn't necessarily just base it on Peter and Paul's word. They based it solely on the word of God and the grace that God was bestowing on Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and all the Gentile churches that Paul had established in his first missionary journey. That's important for us to understand because if we're going to base our church on the church that Jesus built in the book of Acts, we must understand that it's grace alone that we're saved. Nothing more, nothing less. And that grace came at a costly price. It's not cheap grace. It's a costly grace. It cost Jesus his life. It's not something to play with because, listen, when we add to or take away from grace, we add or take away from the finished work of Christ for our salvation. And when we do that, we belittle the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And that's why it was so important to Paul and to Barnabas to make this argument to this Jewish council. When Paul arrived at Jerusalem this particular time for this Jewish council, it was 14 years since his last visit to Jerusalem. So when Paul had come to Jerusalem before, remember he went into Cilicia, back up to his hometown, and then he went down to Antioch after seven years with, with uh, or eight years with uh, Barnabas to the church of Antioch, and they spent a year or two there, and then they went on their missionary journey. This is 14 years after Paul had been in Jerusalem that they come back. Paul was not a new believer. He had been a believer for 14 years or longer. So he was seasoned in the study of Scripture. He was not just coming in and bringing about some new doctrine. This is something that God divinely inspired and taught him for us today. And he took it very seriously, as should we. Now, Paul and Barnabas, when they came to Jerusalem, they brought Titus with them. And he was a Gentile convert from their journey in their ministry. And Titus came in kind of as it were, as a role model or somebody they could see that had been transformed by the grace of God who had not been circumcised. He truly had genuine faith, genuinely had been born again, genuinely had been transformed by God, yet he was not a Jew and he was not circumcised. And so this was part of their evidence of God's grace to the Gentiles. Now, I know I'm going on and on about this, but what we don't understand and we forget, had it not been for this, we wouldn't be here today. This is why it's so important. I'm passionate about the book of Galatians because I would not be here had it not been for God's grace to the Gentiles. And bringing this under his under that fold of his grace. So in this chapter, in verses 1 to 10, Paul has three encounters. First of all, he has a private encounter, verses 1 and 2, with the leaders of Jerusalem. He has a private meeting. It's Paul and Barnabas and Titus. And then there's Peter, James, and John. John, the son of Zebedee. Uh, James, the brother or half-brother of Jesus, who was the pastor of the church of Jerusalem, and then Peter, who was a patriarch, if you will, of the church from Acts chapter 2 and then Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' household. They came there after their first missionary journey to, uh, to act. They began to testify of God and open the door, how God opened the door to the Gentiles. That comes from Acts 14, 27. The Jews at Jerusalem were so upset at the, with, the, with the report that they went to Antioch and taught that a Gentile had to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. That's Acts 15.1. So these people got so upset at this mer mer message of grace 
that they went to Antioch to stir up trouble and to cause division. Any time that we think that we have it all figured out and we try to change people by our argument sometimes, sometimes we do more damage than good. And that's what these guys did. They caused division at Antioch. They stirred up a hornet's nest, if you will. This led to Barnabas and Paul and Titus going down to this council. So the big issue with them was circumcision because in the Jewish mindset, submitting to circumcision meant accepting and obeying the entire Jewish law. You see, back in Genesis, God commanded that they circumcise the child, the male child. And it was an act of separation. And it became to where if you became a Jew and you were circumcised, you were then expected to obey and live by the entire Mosaic law. So what they were saying, these Judaizers, was you need to be circumcised, but circumcision brings with it much more than just circumcision, a physical act. It has to do with obeying the law of Moses. Totally contrary to the gospel of grace. That Paul says Jesus brought about through his finished work. You see, we can't live by the law and by grace. The law was given to show us that we were weak and needed a Savior. Jesus came to fulfill the law as our Savior so that we would place faith in him. We have completed the law. Because of Christ in us and that faith in his finished work. When Paul and Barnabas confronted this false teaching of circumcision, there was a heated, heated argument, Acts 15, 2. So they decided to take the matter before the leaders in Jerusalem. Paul met with the leaders privately as he was sent by revelation. Let's look at Galatians 2, 2. It says, I went up in response to a revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. So in Acts 15 and here in Galatians 2, Paul is saying, I was sent by God to do this. It was a, a revelation from God that I go and that I do this and I go to Jerusalem and tell them the message that I presented to the gospels. He met them privately so he could make sure all that he and Barnabas had done was not in vain. Now Paul was not concerned about the message. He was concerned that if the leaders sided with the Judaizers that the ministry of, of Jesus had called him into would be in jeopardy. In other words, if Paul and Barnabas didn't meet with the people at Jerusalem and hear him privately, if the Judaizers won them over... The entire ministry of grace under Paul could have been stopped. See, we look back on it today and we don't think about that. But in Paul's day, Paul was not trying to defend him or his argument. He was trying to defend the gospel. Because had these Judaizers won, we'd still be obeying the law. If even Gentiles would could be grafted in. Now we know God ordained that and God wanted that, but the people of Israel, the Jewish people, did not want that. And they were doing everything within their power to stop it. And so Paul and Barnabas went and met with them one-on-one -on -one so they could defend what God had called them to do with evidence. It is so important that when we have issues that we sit down and talk it out. Walk through it. Share the facts. Because therein is freedom. When you hide things or keep things in the secret or in the dark, it gives the enemy room to, room to prowl. 
He roams in the darkness, in the secrecy, in the half-truths of our mind and our hearts. But when we allow ourselves to be transparent, when we allow ourselves to share what's going on and how we... Then it allows the Lord the, the opportunity to come in and bring light and bring healing and bring victory over any situation. And Paul and them knew this. The result of their argument was that the leaders approved and supported Paul's ministry and gospel message. They added nothing to it. Let's look at verse 6. In the last part of verse 6 he says... God shows no partiality to anyone. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. They added nothing to me or to my message. And so we need to understand that when Peter, James, and John, the three pillars in Jerusalem, heard the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, they approved it with grace and blessed it, and they added nothing to it. That speaks volumes. You see, Peter grew up under the teaching of Jesus and was very much a Jew. And James, his brother, and if you read the book of James and you understand James did not have faith in Jesus while Jesus was alive, but the Lord appeared to him after he had been resurrected and James got saved and became the leader of the church of Jerusalem. But if you read his book, you will find all kinds of Jewish tradition and Jewish reading in his book. And so when Paul came and shared this message of grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and that alone for salvation and nothing added to it, it was, it was really an act of God to get it for them to see it because they had never seen anything like this. I mean, look at all through the Gospels how the uh, apostles and disciples said, Jesus, how much longer? Jesus, when are you going to restore our nation? When are you going to overthrow the Romans and set up your kingdom? All throughout their ministry, they always questioned Jesus about natural, physical things that they understood from a Jewish mindset. And Jesus was all the time trying to teach them kingdom spiritual principles. And they kept not under. So when Paul went there to share this message, it was important that the Holy Spirit opened their eyes to see the message. Any message we try to present, people's eyes have to be opened. Because our natural man cannot understand spiritual things. The Bible tells us that. And therefore, when I go. To minister at any capacity, I always pray, God, open the eyes of the hearers. Open the ears of the hearers. That they see you and that they hear you. I don't care if you hear me or not. I want you to hear what he has to say. Because it's him that matters. I don't proclaim James Lewis. I proclaim Jesus Christ. And when we go to minister to people or we go to talk to people... Our prayer should be, God, open their eyes. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Give them understanding, spiritual understanding, so that when they hear, they know that I'm speaking of your kingdom and not something here on this earth. And that's what Paul and them did. Next, we have the public meeting in verses 3 to 5. It's also in Acts 15, verses 6 to 21. Peter began this meeting over in Acts 15, with his testimony of God's grace to the Gentiles at Cornelius' household in Acts chapter 10. He concluded, here's Peter's conclusion, because the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit just as did the 120 in Acts chapter 2, that the, there was no difference between Jew and Gentile. It was a different lesson and a transition for many Jews because all the way back to Isaac, there had been a difference and a separation between Jew and Gentile. So you're breaking six, seven thousand years of tradition in one meeting. That's not easy to do. 
It takes the Holy Spirit to break that kind of tradition. And Peter was sharing that there was no separation between Jew and Gentile. In Jesus' death on the cross, he broke down this separation, this partition between Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2 and 11, 2, 11 and 12, so that in Christ there is no racial differences, Jew, Gentile, Greek, barbarian, and all of that, Galatians 3.28. Peter declared there was only one way of salvation, and that was faith in Christ. Now you've got to understand, here's Peter. He is, if you will, the inner circle three of Christ. He was the one that stuck his foot in his mouth all the time. He was the one that denied Christ three times at the trial of Jesus. He was the one that was restored on the Sea of Galilee on the shore and to Jesus told him to feed his sheep. He was the one that stood up in Acts chapter 2 and said, See what you're hearing here, these men are not drunk, but as a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, they have been filled with the Holy Spirit to proclaim Jesus Christ, whom you crucified as both Lord and King. And 3,000 people got saved. This Peter, who was a Jew, who understood Jewish law, stood up and said, Only by faith in Christ can man be saved. That was a work and an act of God and God alone for Peter to make that declaration. Then Paul and Barnabas testified as to what God had done among the Gentile, Acts 15, 12. Now can you imagine being in this meeting, hearing this mission's report, and these false brethren that Paul calls them, these Judaizers, were most likely very upset, yet Paul wanted the truth of the gospel to continue to the Gentiles. Verse 5 of Galatians 2. We did not yield to subjection to them, nor for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In other words, Paul did not even give heed to their words or give them the opportunity to pour into him what they were pouring out because he wanted the truth of the gospel to continue to the Galatian church and to the Gentile world. There's a word for the church today. Don't let anything in the church keep you from reaching lost people. Titus was there an example of a Gentile who had not been circumcised, yet was very much a believer. And these Judaizers in Acts 15.1 stated, except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. And this would mean, if that were the case, that Titus would not have been saved. But he was a saved man, and he gave evidence of his salvation, having the Holy Spirit disproving these Judaizers. In other words, Titus not only told them his testimony, there was an experience, a Holy Spirit encounter that proved that he had been born again, discounting these Judaizers. Listen, it amazes me at the tenacity of people that hear a truth, see the evidence of that truth, and still doubt it and argue against it. And that's exactly what these Judaizers did. <laughs> James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, gave the results of this conference, Acts chapter 15, uh, 13 through 21. He made it clear that Gentile did not have to become Jewish to become a Christian. Could you imagine in our world today if somebody said you had to become this to become a Christian or you had to become this to become a Christian? Genuine Christians would be going, no, 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 you don't have to become anything. Come, what's the old song? Just as I am. 
just as you are. And yet, James, the brother of Jesus, who we know was a Jew and Jewish roots and Jewish tradition, said and made it very clear that Gentiles did not have to become Jewish to become a Christian. Now, that is a major declaration. That's not an easy statement for James. That's not an easy statement for the church of the first century. And it holds implications that still affect us today. It still affect the church today. Paul and the gospel had won. And Paul all through this book of Galatians refers to liberty and bondage as he does circumcision. Those are the three primary things that he talks about in this book. Paul was more concerned about the truth of the gospel, not the peace of the church. Let me say that again. Paul was, Paul was more concerned about the truth of the gospel not the peace of the church. Now, that's a hard statement. But Paul was willing to stand on the grace of God, understanding the message and the call and the ministry that God had called him to, even if it caused this dissension in the beginning at this council of Jerusalem. How many times do we Weaken our faith by trying to appease people in the body. That's a hard statement, but it's a reality, and we've all seen it, where people give in to acquiesce. We need some Pauls that will stand up to the gospel, even if it means at times having conflict. And so we should be grateful for Paul's stance and we should too stand just like Paul did. People from every generation have tried to add something to the simple gospel of grace message. They have tried uh, faith in Christ plus, plus good works, plus baptism, plus the Ten Commandments, plus church membership and church rituals and many other things. And Paul makes it plain that those who teach such things are wrong. The third group here is, it was a personal confirmation. Verses 6 to 10. And in verse 6, Paul showed that he was not impressed by the Judaizers, nor the church leaders. Let's look at it. He wasn't being disrespectful, but he says, but of those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality to anyone. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. In other words, Paul was saying, I know who I am in Christ. You can try to be a big shot if you want to. You can try to know all things if you want to. You can be the leader of the Sanhedrin if you want to. That means nothing to me in Christ. And he made the statement that there is no partiality with anyone with God. We are all equal at the cross. Everybody. And Paul made that very plain. He respected those, but said God shows no partiality. Then he noted how God had entrusted to him the gospel to the Gentiles and to Peter the Jews. It was the same message, but it was two audiences. Let's look at it in verse number 7. He says, on the contrary, they saw that I was entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised or to the Gentiles, as the gospel to the circumcised was to Peter. In other words, Peter was called to be the evangelist to the Jews, and Paul was called to be the evangelist to the Gentiles. Now, we know 
that Paul did not only minister to Gentiles because any time he went into a city that had a synagogue, that's where he started. He went to the Jewish people first. In one of the cities he went to, he went to the synagogue and started teaching in the synagogue. And the second week, they run him out. Because they didn't want to hear the message of grace. So Paul ministered to both Jews and Gentiles, but his primary ministry was to the Gentiles as was Peter was to the Jews. And we know that Peter ministered to the Gentiles. He went to Cornelius' household in Acts chapter 10, but that was not his primary audience. Just as Peter and Paul had different ministries to different audiences, so do people today. However, we should all preach the same message of Christ and Him crucified to build the kingdom. We are not in competition with other churches. There should be no spirit of competition among churches that are believers in the finished work of Jesus Christ. We're here to build up one kingdom, His kingdom. <coughs> Paul said... "We." We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I'm not in a hard fight or a wrestling match with other churches or other denominations. I'm here to build up the kingdom of God and pour people to Jesus. That is my ministry and my call. In Galatians 1, Paul talked about his independence from the apostles. He was called and ordained by God, not the apostles. And here in chapter 2... Paul points out his interdependence with those apostles by going down and having this meeting with them, depending on them for this gospel message to continue to the Gentile. I love that, that, that I saw that and brought that out because in the first chapter, Paul was arguing that it, nobody called him but God. He was independently called. The apostles had no say in his calling. God called him on the road to Damascus. But here in chapter 2, even though he's independent, he shows his interdependence working with those apostles to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's important. Because even though I'm an individual person in Christ, we need one another. And we need to work together. To build the kingdom of God. And to carry this gospel message. In this last verse. Verse 10. Paul shares the practical message. Of the conference. Helping the poor. Listen to what he says. He says. Only the request they requested, the Jewish leaders, they only requested that we should remember the poor, which I also was eager to do. We need correct doctrine, which is what Paul talks about in chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2. But we also need practical, applicable ministry. It's not just okay to be correct doctrinally. We need to be practical and applicable in our ministry. And in this case, it was helping the poor. Both correct doctrine and applicable ministry, they go together. Oftentimes, we discuss issues within the church, the body of Christ, but not often enough do we offer practical help for a needy world. Now, we've gotten much better at that in the church world, but there's still a lot of people that have needs that we have actually opportunity to minister to and to help. Now, when the leaders told Paul or to remember the poor and to care for them, it was not an issue because Paul himself had always been interested in helping the poor, Acts 11, 27 to 30. 
now that this conference was over and the leader supported Paul, you would think that the debate was over. But no, it wasn't. These Judaizers continued to interfere with Paul's ministry and invaded the churches that he founded trying to take people back to bondage in the law when they had learned freedom in Christ. Paul began carrying the council's decision to the churches in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, but these Judaizers followed and harassed him and the churches every single place he went. Acts 15, 23. And to other areas where he ministered to, Acts 16, 4. In other words, he went to Antioch, Cilicia, and there, and then he went to other areas of his first missionary journey to share the great message from the church in Jerusalem. And every time he went, the Judaizers come in to squash his message. To overthrow his message of grace. Even the one that the church at Jerusalem has supported with great eagerness. And seem all for the blessing. So not only were these Judaizers contradicting Paul and stirring up trouble with the message of grace. They were going against the very church they come from in Jerusalem. That had gave, the council had given, this is what you're to do. We support your ministry. We bless your ministry. And the people that brought it up continued to go against their own leadership and their own church to hinder Paul's ministry. These Judaizers even swayed Peter in Antioch in verse number 11. And we're going to go there next week, but I'm going to read it today. But when Peter came to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, to face, because he stood condemned. Before certain men came from James, he ate with the Gentiles. Okay, in other words, from Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles in Antioch. But these men from James, sent by James from the church in Jerusalem, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. He began to fear the Jews. He wanted to please the Jews. And Paul had to confront him to his face. And then, but listen in verse number 13, in the last part of verse 14, it says, so that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Even Barnabas began to buy into this. This is how bombarding these Judaizers were, that even Paul's associate and ministry partner began to buy into what they were saying. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. And who you allow to speak into your life. And don't give place to people that are contrary to the gospel. Because if you're not careful, be like Peter or Barnabas. And we're going to go there next week. Father, we thank you for that.